Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I'm replacing the MC, the official MC. Let's see, needs to uh, to go to work. I would like to give the floor immediately to uh, Sheikh Hakim Murad, or Professor, uh, Professor Timothy Winter from Cambridge uh, Muslim College. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Excellency, Special Councillor, uh, Ambassador, uh, respected uh, President of this uh, important university, uh, thank you so much for honoring me with this uh, uh, invitation. Blessed are those who recognize the importance of providing a neutral, hospitable space for the vitally important global project of uh, supporting uh, constructive religion. I want to start uh, with uh, tension, curious tension, in the religious iconography of Europe, which is the representation of the nature-grace tension or dichotomy by the appearance of the figure of the, the green man. This is a very recurrent image, familiar uh, quite often as a kind of bacchic face, spouting acanthus leaves from mouth and eyes, which appears in a very startling number of our historic churches here in the Netherlands and across uh, Western Europe. In my own country, we have some very well-known examples at Rochester Cathedral, Bolton Abbey, and even St. Magnus's Cathedral up in windswept Orkney. But thousands and thousands of these enigmas show their face across Western Europe, lurking in the capitals of columns OG arches and beneath uh, monastic benches, misericords. Frazier, in his classic The Golden Bough, identifies this half-hidden, satirical, yet often severe and staring faith as a pagan survival, a fertility symbol of the spring, a jack in the green, a, a kind of Robin Hood. And some of the iconography certainly recalls themes associated with the old Nordic deities such as Odin. And modern neo-paganism, as it calls itself, in its curious belief that primordial initiatic traditions can be recreated for the modern middle classes, has often mobilized the green man in this sense. Here in Holland, as elsewhere, in Flevoland, for instance, uh, there is a green man gallery where uh, artworks of a generally neo-pagan inspiration may be viewed and purchased. As Europe, in which we live, casts off its Christian inheritance, these half-banished sprites seem to have descended from the cobwebbed vaults of parish churches to reign again in our secular dystopia, where a prevalent dream seems to be that through a carefully selected reversion to pagan and shamanistic ideas, we can heal the alienation from ourselves and from nature which technology has imposed upon us. More scholarly literature, however, tells a more interesting tale. Although there are late Roman equivalents to the green man, for instance, at Nero's palace in Rome, these are quite different from those which appear suddenly from the 11th century onwards in Christian churches. Evidently, they represent, in the Roman context, specific deities, Silvanus, Bacchus, Dionysus, with an ecstatic and intoxicated aspect. Art historians point to a significant transformation which seems to have accompanied the rather sudden intrusion of the man into church architecture in the 11th century after he had effectively disappeared during the Dark Ages, the so-called Dark Ages. The features of the Roman deities, which in any case had not survived the collapse of the empire, are replaced with something noticeably less occult and wild and more esoteric. Beyond this, however, those faces remain a puzzle and an enigma. Why, amidst the triumph of Christianity, should this eminently non-biblical figure be present in the churches in the first place? The green man is there in medieval folklore, the English narrative of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, for instance, and in the names of countless pubs. But why is he in church? One common answer supplied by the art historians connects to the emergence of the Gothic style itself. In much of its form and partly in its sacral logic, this new style, 
ironically perhaps the only fully Christian style of building in the West, was enabled by the Crusades, after which Muslim and Eastern Christian masons and master craftsmen were brought to the West to trigger the sudden aesthetic and engineering breakthrough which we identify with the Gothic genius. In this context, we can perhaps begin to grasp a conflation in monastic minds between the pagan and the Saracenic. Indeed, for medieval Christians, Islam was simply a manifestation of the pagan principle. It was of the flesh, of nature, while Christianity was of the spirit. So we can begin to understand this presence amidst the gargoyles and the strangely erotic figures present in the ecclesial shadows as a Christian defiance of nature, represented by the Saracenic enemy. Islam is of the body, the church is of grace, the stare of the green man and his inextricability from vegetation are there to show the triumph of the altar. Through the miracle of the sacrament, the shadows have been chased away, the flesh is defeated by the sinless new Adam in whose immunity from concupiscence we are all invited to share. So here, on this view, the church building, an open book in which the illiterate peasant reads the story of salvation, reminds worshippers of the dichotomy of nature against grace, and ultimately of Christ's great sacrifice, perfectly represented by the torture of a body and the triumph of spirit. Through mortification we may repent and escape the gravity of eros and of death. In heaven there is to be no marriage, and the body is made unlike itself. And the life of the saints in this world below is to be a lived anticipation of that heavenly state. Hence, for instance, the celibacy of the clergy and of all the saints. But there is more going on here. Henri Corbin, uh, the great mid-20th century Islamicist whose work on Islam has influenced uh, Muslim scholars around the world, was of course particularly fascinated by Ibn Arabi and ways in which his characteristic doctrine of the creative imagination might enrich European thought, reeling from the impact of the Enlightenment and also the catastrophic Darwinian political ideologies of the 20th century. The translator of Heidegger, he recognised in Heidegger's account of being a critical lack the principle that Ibn Arabi likes to call nafs al-Rahman, the breath of the compassionate. This is the primordial but unceasing divine exhalation which brings being out of non-being. It is the meaning of absence itself. And for Ibn Arabi, this breath is what permits a mediation between the human world and the realm of divine fullness. It is the presence which allows access to the inner meaning of the Qur'an and prohibits us from stopping only at its outward surface. It allows the commentator, the jurist, and the ethical philosopher to ground his or her interpretation in the ontology of the text, and not only its zahir, its plain sense. It is, therefore, a shield against fundamentalism, and also against reductionist, philological, and historicizing reasons that dissect the organism of the word as though it were a dead thing. Its symbol is the eight-pointed star, which denotes the intersection a mutual definition of the fourfold heavenly and earthly planes, and as such it is fundamental to Muslim sacred geometry, particularly in mosques. The loss of this principle, Corbin suggests, has been the great defining drama of the West in its downward journey from Christianity to profane materialism. The Gothic style, to which, in which Latin Christendom finally found its soul, which had never been purely expressed by the essentially pagan and static language of the Romanesque, is a gift from the Muslim East. Fan vaults, arches culminating in a sign to heaven, stained glass windows with their evident and very effective symbolic meaning. But in this Islamic upliftment of the European soul, which gifted to Christendom its truest aesthetic expression, we find also the intrusion of the green man, this peeping, staring visage, speaking what exactly? Corbin again offers us a critical clue. For him, as for Louis Massignon, the inner sanctum of the Quranic text is Surat al-Kahf, the surah of the cave. Here a sequence of sapiential and initiatic tales are recited, each reminding us inescapably of the evident inadequacy of a purely external reading. And in the heart of the Quran's heart, there is the enigmatic tale of the journey of Moses to the esoteric navel of the world, the meeting place of the two seas. And in the Qur'an's telling, Moses does not travel alone, 
Instead, this paradigm of legal uprightness and moral strength has a guide whom he asks to follow and who shows him, through a series of three baffling and apparently unethical actions, the limitations of the external law. The Qur'an is not here invalidating the laws which Moses is apparently asked to break. It's merely reminding us that external rulings and readings are at best a point of view. Even to kill someone can be moral and wise once the full context is disclosed. Moses asks for this ilm la dunni, this esoteric wisdom, or to be truer to the Qur'anic phrase, the knowledge that is from and of the divine presence. The revelation's doughty emblem of legal probity and defiance of state tyranny, he defeats Pharaoh's magicians by showing them a supernatural act of a higher nature than theirs, his staff, which in the Qur'an's discourse becomes a snake by God's leave. Thus does the prophetic soul see that cause and effect and the gigantic web of causation, which we take to be a first-order truth, and the basis for our every action in this world is merely a convention, ada, not reality. Moses' teacher grants a direct vision of what we might call nowadays quantum indeterminacy. Causation is probabilistic at best. This is the lesson shown to Moses by his mysterious travelling companion and mentor, whom the commentary tradition calls Al-Khidr. Our Western Muslim theological tradition has much to say about this clearly essential Quranic figure, who alone of all the entities under God can be the guide of a prophet and can rightly correct him. Henry Bayman, in his book The Secret of Islam, is inviting us to an inward perspective which can recognize the necessity of this Quranic surprise. He presents this esoteric guide in, to scriptural and legal interpretation as an affective principle. For him, it is the principle of love, mahabba, which is the subject of a very major work by Imam al-Ghazali. So this is what Bayman writes. Because law is based on conscience and ultimately upon love, what is lawful in Islam is that which is informed by love. The only action which is free of blame is that which is based on love. And the divine law is a compendium of such action or non-action. Thus, Islam answers the critical question, how should I behave towards beings, in the following concise way. Treat them as if you loved them. And for our convenience, Islam outlines in its prescriptions of holy law what such action is. This is Bayman's way of understanding Sharia. It is the articulation of philanthropy in its original full sense. And beyond this, when we need to ask the question of how to love and how to know that one's acts are loving, there is the nafas rahman the breath of the compassionate, without which ethics becomes, in the modern way, just a point of view that in our, in our culture we are familiar with. And Samir Dajani, in his recent book on Ibn Arabi's jurisprudence, shows us how the Andalusian master's literalism in reading the Qur'an was in fact not a zahiri superficiality but was guided by an inward inspiration that from a position of radical egolessness reliably intuited the real meaning of the text which turns out to be at its most profound when it is most literally read. Love in this deeper sense is a disposition of being, uh, an essence rather than an accident. The eight-pointed star is permanently fixed. The world is also a scripture written by God, composed of signs. Ayat, in a Qur'an taqwini, as Ibn Arabi says, distinct from but intertextual with the Qur'an tadwini, the inscribed Qur'an, which the believer holds in his or her hands. The Qur'an taqwini is always the manifestation of the breath of the compassionate, for nothing can exist otherwise. However, human readings of the world may be perverted by the ego until we only see dead matter and oppressive causal chains from which we could never escape. In this sense, natural science dismays us with jabber, with compulsion, without even the illusion of free will. Likewise, in the absence of the human sense of the breath of the compassionate, we cannot read scripture. Instead, we find only, as he puts it, letters without vowels, and thus we habitually misread. Fundamentalism and all other deviant impositions on God's book flow from this contamination of the reader by ego and other psychic residues. 
Norman Brown, in his article, The Prophetic Tradition, writes about Al-Khidr as a trans-prophetic figure urgently required in today's linear and flat world. And we note that this mysterious personage, while recalling immortal esoteric guides in other traditions, such as Hermes Trismegistus or Elijah, is in an Islamic matrix necessarily green. This is Islam's color, indicated by the prophet's oasis city of Medina, and the green dome which rises over the enigma of the ongoing prophetic presence. Green also the color of the Natat al Here we return to the mystery of Europe's green man. Historians suggest that this transmission or this transfusion from east to west came through Ismaili influence and then various esoteric Christian fraternities. Almost certainly the channels by which such a tradition reached us will never be clearly discernible. Yet what is important is that it took place. The green man becomes a sign of nature, of the breath of the compassionate, and of virgin nature, until with the Renaissance it then mutates into a very different symbol of man's domination over the natural order. So we seem to be confronting a seemingly paradoxical elision between a pagan and a Quranic motif. The green man of the Quranic commentaries is certainly not a pagan magus, in the context of the scripture's titanic struggle against Arab paganism, that would be a very curious deployment. An initiatic paganism is not in the Qur'an's palette. Instead, we find that the initiator, conspicuously capable of correcting Moses, is a purely monotheistic figure who seeks to purify and correct the law rather than overturning it in some kind of antinomian Dionysian manner. At this point, I think it's helpful to recall the strikingly primordial nature of uh, the Ishmaelite style of monotheism. This has been recalled by a number of uh, Western Muslim writers like Charles-André Gillis, for instance. Islam is emphatically not pagan, but the site of its emergence is not a Levantine city partaking in the fullness of the ancient ecumenical culture, but is the Umm al-Qura, the mother of cities, seen as detached from the late antique world. Unquestionably, the Quranic text recalls primordial and natural themes far more than, say, the New Testament does. The early Meccan passages ceaselessly invoke the sun and the moon, the fertilizing rain, the winds, male and female, tree and plain. In part, of course, this conjuring with the natural world is part of a rhetoric which undermines pagan Arab religion by attributing natural phenomena to a transcendent deity rather than to individual and competing spirits. But it does this not by desacralizing these phenomena, but by intensifying their holiness and their theophanic indicativity by insisting on a god who is called al qarib the near. The Chicago literary scholar Yaroslav Stedkevich, in his book Muhammad and the Golden Bow, notes the striking quality of the Qur'an's litanies of nature, with God even swearing oaths by its phenomena. والشمس وضحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والليل إذا يغشاها والنهار إذا جلاها by the sun and its forenoon, by the moon when it follows, by the night when it covers, by the day when it makes its plain, these makes it plain. These verses really incantatory in a way reminiscent of truly ancient deliverances by seers and entranced mediators are very frequent. Again, they can be seen as part of a strategy of reattributing natural signs to the Semitic Godhead and hence of underlining their luminous sanctity. Stedkevich writes this of the Quran's chapter of Joseph, Surat Yusuf. Unlike the Genesis account of Joseph, the Quranic rendition is not an ideology saturated pretense of tribal history, and for that reason it is more detached and more archetypal and thus closer to myth. Detached and archetypal, this seems exactly right and is surely a sufficient argument against speculators who try to place the genesis of the Quranic text in an Eastern Mediterranean or Mesopotamian sectarian milieu. Not only does the Quran Tedwini reference the Quran Taqwini with frequently and hypnotically chanted adversions to the great signs of virgin nature, but it takes a quite remarkable view of the sacral performativity of the natural order. 
Here, particularly, it distinguishes itself from other scriptural narratives and also from the later Hellenism. With the Qur'an's insistence on the animated aspect of nature, we are again in a very primordial register of discourse. For the Qur'an, the cosmos is not inert and insensate matter, but appears to be alive, not just some dimensions of it and an animal or vegetal nature, but the entire order of cre creation. وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ There is no thing that does not glorify him with praise. That's Surah Al-Isra. Do you not see that everything that is in the heavens and the earth glorifies God? Surah Al-Nur. In several well-known and well-attested hadiths, the Holy Prophet takes pebbles in his hand and the companions are miraculously enabled to hear them praising God. He speaks to a mountain, Mount Thabir, when it starts to shake from the spiritual presence of the Holy Prophet walking upon it. He scuffs it with his foot and says, Askin Thabir, be quiet or be still, Thabir. And it is still. He says, Uhud is a mountain which loves us and which we love. And the commentator, Nawawi, affirms that a metaphorical neutralization of this startling claim is impossible to support from the Arabic words. Regarding the animal kingdom, we find a very distinctive prophetic virtue ethic of compassion and respect. Here are some representative uh, and very familiar hadiths. A dog was once, pant was once panting by a well, almost dead with thirst. On seeing it, a harlot of the ancient Israelites removed her slipper, dipped it in the water and gave it to drink. For this, God remitted her sins. It is a great sin for a man to imprison the animals which are in his power. We were once on a journey with God's messenger who left us for a short while. We saw a humara bird, seems to have been a sparrow of some kind, with two young, and we took the young fledglings. The humara hovered with fluttering wings, and the prophet returned, saying, who has injured this bird by taking its young, return them to her. There is no one that without reason kills a sparrow or anything higher thereto, but that God shall ask him about it. The Prophet forbade that animals should be set to fight each other. It's a huge body of, of hadith. In some other hadiths, even we find the founder apparently communicating with animals, as in the following story narrated by Abu Dawood. The Prophet, may God bless him and grant him peace, enters into a farm where a camel is experiencing a fit of groaning with its eyes streaming. The Prophet, unafraid, walks over to it and rubs its ears and it quietens down. He asks who the camel belongs to, and a man identifies himself as its owner. The prophet says, do not fear God concerning this beast which he has let you own. It complained to me that you starve it and tire it by excessive work and by using it beyond its capacity. The hadiths also present the natural world and its animals as concerned to protect the prophet and the Meccan sanctuary. The Surah of the Elephant seems to document this, where the elephant of the invading king refuses to march against the Meccan sanctuary, while Abraha's armies are then shattered by stones cast down by a flock of birds. In Medina, likewise, the site for the prophetic mosque is chosen not by human agency, but by the prophet's camel, al qaswa So again, there seems to be something primordial here, and also particularly primordial in the Qur'an's rather... Uh, astonishing, unnerving assertion that other species are communities which in some way are like us. Here's the famous verse. This is Surah 6, verse 38. There is not an animal in the earth nor a bird flying on two wings but that they are nations like yourselves. We have neglected nothing in the book. Then unto their Lord they will be gathered. So each species is an ummah and even more remarkably is in some way like us, perhaps even experiencing resurrection. Commentators argue about this radical and strange passage. Qurtubi, for instance, speaking for the exoteric tradition, states that it means animals are like us in that they have rights. Razi holds that they resemble us in that they have certain physical capacities and behavioural traits. In the Sufi commentaries, inspired by the breath of the compassionate, we find a more dramatic account of this. Here is Ruzbehan Bakli, who dies in 1209, in his commentary entitled Ara'is al-Bayan. God created the animals, birds, predators and insects with a primordial nature, fitra, of monotheism and instinctual knowledge of him, which is why he speaks to them 
and has created for their minds pathways to his eternal presence and secrets. It is by that presence that they live. Their whistling, lowing, singing and roaring are from the sweetness of the spiritual world which is reaching them and the manifest lights of his glory. They long lovingly for God and to taste the oceans of his mercy. So animals have a spiritual life and the sounds they make are their attestation to God's beauty and unity. Further, they are mystics of a sort and this is one of my favourite medieval texts. I can't resist quoting a little bit more. All the nations share a basic created nature in being composed of the four elements and are made with animal and spiritual natures and are equal in eating and drinking, motion and congregation, the qualities of the self and properties of identity, such as desire, anger, passion and pride. This equality, to Sawi, is based in the stuff of the primordial nature, fitra, according to which God made them, as he has said, from it did we create you, to it do we return you, and from it we shall bring you forth one more time. They all have their drinking places in the ocean of God's speech and his eternal words, which indicate the paths of his unity. The nature of animals, birds, and insects and predators is mingled with knowledge of their maker and creator, whose qualities and essence they know. This discourse is not difficult or insufficient for them to understand. Now, the Muslim internal library is absolutely packed with this kind of biophiliac and lyrical vision of a cosmos ontologically engaged in a joyful act of praise. With no Western-style doctrine of original sin, no problematizing of eros, Islam has always been insistent in its regard for the inviolability of the order of nature. This is roughly what the philosophy Herder had in mind when he described Islam as shamanistic. There is a real presence, not only of a single vibration of the sacred, but of localised instantiations of the sacred, sometimes explicitly animated. And in the Indonesian context, this is maintained with a particular authenticity, as the Javanese landscape is experienced as a topography of spiritual as well as physical contours. The Wali Songol and countless lesser shrines are constructed to underline and purify local sanctities. And in their fully traditional forms, they deliberately represent and continue the forms of nature. The batik, in its most ancient forms, links Javanese rites of passage, such as the carrying of an infant, the touching of the ground, the dress of a bride and groom, to the forms of nature. In some of the so-called Burak traditions, especially Islamic motifs are incorporated, but essentially the entire tradition, before it was vulgarized by European figurative intrusions, is a sacred tradition, signifying the indicativity of natural and floral forms bringing the blessings of the natural world into the important moments of human life. Localised, but entirely Islamic, also are the architectonic and decorative configurations of the great Wali Songo shrines. In Indonesia, the Qibla is to the west, and in the mosques attached to the shrines, the worshippers pray towards the magnificent tropical sunset at the time of Maghrib. Flying foxes rise from the forests. The lushness of equatorial life harmonises entirely with the sacred rituals of the Salat. Here in Java, say at Sunan Kudus, Ugunung Jati, one savours the genius of the Quranic primordiality and affirmation of the natural world. In these places, there is nothing of the Arabian, and yet the scriptural vision is radiantly upheld. They appear as very ancient places, sites of a timeless wisdom and initiatic stillness, and their primordiality makes them perfect matrices for the Salat, which, as Rod Blackhurst has noted, is a geometric and cosmic act. In Islam, the sacral act is shaped by the cosmos, by the motions of sun and moon, and the cyclicity of the prayer by which man begins upright in heaven, falls to earth, and then ends in the balanced position of jalsa, suspended between the two, which is the caliphal posture. And this is fully integrated into the motions of the solar system and the music of the spheres. Muslim worship is cosmological, affirmation, affirming the holiness of nature. From air we move to the clay from which we are made and to which the defiant symbol of the forelock is necessarily pressed, after which, thanks to the act of prayer itself and the loving surrender which it represents, we find that balance is restored. The salat, then, is the supreme act of fitra and khilafah. The green man in Europe does not look down upon the Muslim prayer. He is there, as we have suggested, as a reproach to a vision of the world which sees nature as fallen 
and in enmity towards grace. And hence, in the batik culture and in the swirling subtleties of the vegetal motifs in the teak and mahogany carvings of the ancient Javanese mosques and shrines, he is already present, just juxtapose uh, the vegetal swirlings of the green man with much of the Javanese batik, and you'll see what I mean. He is already present. This is already a culture of imminence, of al-Khidr, Islam's prophetic recovery of sacred time in which sun and moon determine the life of sacred spaces makes the solat the characteristic Javanese act. No wonder, then, that the Akbarian tradition put down such very deep roots here, from Sumatra and the reception by Hamza Fansori, Nuruddin Raniri, to the initiatic wisdom traditions of Javanese sages and santris, the radical affirmation of nature's sacrality through a daring formulation of Islamic assurances of divine imminence and the certain presence of spirits, all these make Java what it is, a land of subtle and profound holiness. In Java's sultanic traditions, including those in which rulers themselves act as holy mediators, we likewise find a local hospitality to Quranic principles of ancient kingly wisdom. The supreme ruler for scripture is Suleiman, who also builds the masjid, the temple, the separation of holy and profane realms is impossible in such a world. Sayyid Hossein Nasr has put this very clearly in the following passage from his book, Ideals and Realities of Islam. We have seen that the Qur'an incorporates, he says, the social order into the religious. This is, on the one hand, a recovery, it having been so included in, it, included in all early, whole, tribal and ethnic cultures. The inclusion is likewise logically indicated. The sacred profane dichotomy may be required as an expedient in times and places, but it can never, from the religious point of view, be considered normative. Buddhism and Christianity, the other universal and missionary religions, do not embrace society. The ethnic religions, Hinduism, Judaism, and in a different way, Confucianism and Shintoism do, but with a specificity which makes them unexportable. Muslims today uh, see this illusion largely in ethical terms. Religion must be political since religion has ethical ideals and is horrified by injustice. Tyrants always seek to neutralize religion or to banish it from the councils of state. Remember Hitler's dictum, I do not permit priests to meddle in politics. In this sense, Muslims are not far from the traditional constitution of the British state which fuses church and state into a single establishment, albeit with different hierarchies and discourses. Nothing could be further from Hitler's dream than the modern English parliament, which, despite its current uh, theatrical dysfunctionality, uh, insists that the head of state is the head of the established church, that the prayer book is established by parliament, that parliament sessions begin with prayers, and that a bench of bishops sits by constitutional right in the House of Lords. So that those Islamophobes who, Islamophobes who demand a separation of religion and state, we gently point out that there are major Western democracies which refuse such a separation. The combination, sensibly orchestrated, can work admirably. And the pre-colonial sultanic centers of Java show thus how this operates in an Islamic context. Plurality and flexibility are ensured while securing the realm and the population from chaos and amputation from the rich meaning supplied by embeddedness in society and tradition. So Islam seems to be tradition-mindedness incarnate. Its forms of worship, notably which shape the faithful life, are astoundingly stable and unchanging. They haven't changed at all, it seems, from the religion's earliest times. And this stability and the reassurance which it brings in times of our liquid modernity doubtless accounts for much of the popularity of Islam, despite growing levels of hostility from its cult despisers around the world. This is part of the charism of Ishmael. Established elites demand conformity and compliance to get Ishmael's annoying conspicuousness out of the way. But those demands seem only to strengthen the believer and to vindicate his sense that his life for God and for justice is more meaningful than any subaltern compliance could ever be. So the green man, grimacing or laughing from a dusty Gothic corner, is still present in our postmodern Europe. But he is no longer expressing a prophetic discontent with the dialectic of nature and grace. Instead, he inhabits the inner cities, sweeps the trains, and builds Mercedes and Renault cars to return value to shareholders whom he will never meet. 
He is Ishmael, the type of the outcast and the disdained, and he urgently needs to reconnect with the most authentic and fluorescent dimensions of his sacred heritage if he is to discharge his high calling in Europe, which is to point to God, to heal and to unite. Ishmaelites in postmodern Europe are called to be this leaven in the dough. Like the green man and his folkloric epigones, they are holy dissidents, possessed of a wisdom which is not merely linear. In Europe, they dispute what Charles Taylor calls the felt flatness of modernity. Europe's green men and women are prophetic reminders of humanity's natural abode in heaven, in the source of all life, in the homeland of biology, which is paradisal. In this way, we belong more truly than those exiled from faith in Abraham's God could ever belong. A European Muslim of Moroccan, Turkish or Indonesian parentage, by believing in God, is more a part of Europe's deepest and most irreplaceable heritage than any secular xenophobe could claim to be. Europe, in its recurrent and most profound and glorious identity, is Christian in many different ways, and Jewish also in many different ways. The idea of God and the assurance of heaven has been the essence of European life. And so we make the claim that Muslims belong here to the real, deep Europe. Secular politicians, whatever their desperate claims, have no more than shallow roots. They are, in many cases, aliens. They're themselves foreigners, immigrants from planet atheism. And the green men and women have a family life which also recalls how Europe used to be. Figures now show that more than half of British people see family and friends less than once a month. This figures released last week. This is certainly not the Muslim way. Muslims are socially conservative. In many ways, the real Europeans of a more European age would have recognised those who would have affirmed the Catholic slogan of this university, which is also a very Islam-friendly motto. Hmm. We genuinely share in these deep forms. And so we find the prophetic saying, the whole earth is made a mosque for me. To be true, we have a true belongingness here, for we profess so much of what always constituted the deepest truth of European culture. All humans, irrespective of outward religious appurtenance, have a capacity to recognise and to yearn for the fitra, and they should be able to see that in us. The Quran again, Surah Al-Rum, the original pattern of God that in accordance with which he originated all people. There is no changing the creation of God. So I think we should be confident that a real uncompromising fitri Islam will always gather an audience of respect. Conversions which are ongoing are perhaps one sign of this. But our green men and women are European khulafa often more. The Qur'anic insistence on the sacrality of nature and the rights of other species, which are umamun amthalukum, nations like yourselves, is precisely the vision which the Green Parties need. Nature is not just useful to our survival and hence worth saving, it is sacred, a symphony of God's signs, inviolable and glorious. Here, precisely, the Islamic caliphal role shows Islam as the green religion par excellence. Of course, this may not be what our neighbours think we are. Mostly they are ignorant of our theology, our ethics and our spirituality. Mostly, too, they choose not to befriend us, although this is beginning to change. Ishmael is misunderstood to everyone's detriment. As Imam Ali pointed out, man is the enemy of what he does not understand. To overcome this, then, is the calling, the imperative, the charism of Ishmael, and an entailment of the fitra, for your animals whose nature it is to communicate. There is a lot of work to do. First, we need to state more clearly than we have been able to do that there is a normative Islam, which is indeed the beautiful Deen al-Fitra, exemplified, for instance, by the heritage of the Nahdud al-Ulama and the mainstream, library-rooted, mysticism-friendly heritage of our civilization. By uh, contrast, there is fundamentalism, radical Islamism, and the lethal dreams of Islam not as deen but as ideology. The catastrophes of modern Islamic dysfunction on the basis of which our neighbours rush to judge us are the consequence of the bastardising of our discourse by illicit and unstable intrusions of fundamentalist discourse 
and of narratives of post-colonial grievance. So our green men and women must grimace at the errors of fundamentalism so systematically rejected by our classical heritage. And where fundamentalism grows, thanks to resentment and ignorance, we must constantly reproach our governments, which for whatever reason have been in a clinch with Gulf fundamentalist governments. Washington, too, has been guilty of this, more now than ever. They cannot reproach us for the spread of fundamentalism when they have been aiding and abetting it themselves for so long. The recent transfer of control of the Brussels Central Mosque to the Belgian Muslim community, I think, is a welcome sign of what can and has to be achieved. So, uh, to wind up, the Islam of the Middle Way cannot be achieved with some kind of piecemeal exoteric tampering with scriptures or forced and unrealistic new ijtihads. State manipulation of Islam is very likely to further anger, alienate and strengthen the extremists. Instead, we need to turn within and to bring out the luminosity of the fitra, the green natural way, the way of the heart, remembering Abraham's prayer for Ishmael and his children, make hearts of mankind inclined towards them. This is Abraham's prayer for us. So we are at a crossroads. Our brethren who have fallen into inauthenticity with their fury, vengefulness and ideology religion are not the way forward for an Islam of fitra and of da'wah. They are people of tanfir, repelling hearts that God wishes to be attracted and they carry a heavy burden of responsibility for what they have done. Instead, let us remember again the Wali Songo, who are not moderates in some insipid modern way, but were passionate and uncompromising champions of truth. Their interpretation of Qur'an and our holy tradition was shaped not by ego but by spirit, not by nafs but by ruh in Ibn Arabi's way. And thus Islam entered the hearts of the great Javanese people. That miracle can happen again. But for that extraordinary day to come, we must turn again to the spirit, to the ahsani taqweem. We must green ourselves by bathing in the light of nature. We must demonstrate the glory of our worship and our beliefs. We must be the cupbearers who bring the zamzam water of Ishmael to the thirsty throats of a Europe which has been materialistic for too long. In our greening of Europe, let us hope for reconciliation, blessing, and the victory of true rather than false religion. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.